the, the schedule got screwed up because I was supposed to be on the East Coast, but my uh, flight got changed and now I'm on the West Coast. So it's oh, wow. early here. <laughs> wow. We, we yeah. could have done this a little later if I had known. Hey, that's all right. It's a good reason for me to get up and get cleaned up. <laughs> yeah. How, how have you been, uh, Frank? You've been well? I've been well. Um, I've I've stayed uh, really creative during the, uh, the mm-hmm. pandemic shutdown. Um, I've been coaching some young up and coming bands and yeah, recording the that, yeah. studio. Mm-hmm. And I uh, just wrote a new Tesla song, and that's always a, a, yeah. a milestone. <laughs> yeah, and you guys are uh, going to get back on the road August fifth first Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. four days before we leave for the august 5th show um the singer jeff and myself have been practicing for the past two months together he and i as a duo working Mm -hmm. on some different song ideas with the vocals and stuff nice and the group is going to get together and uh, then tesla will be getting on a bus the night of august 4th nice and uh, this is you guys you'll you're doing some dates uh it's just tesla and then it's tesla and leonard skinner right there's some Leonard Skinner uh, dates that we're opening. There's a couple Kid Rock dates and a couple Sticks shows nice. as well. Nice. So tell me, Frank, how does your set list change? So when you guys, when you're playing with Leonard Skinner and, and when you're just playing, uh, you know, shows on your own, how I'm guessing you play longer when you guys, when y'all are the only ones playing, right? Yeah, when we're headlining uh, a full show, um, our set list is at least 15 or 16 songs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, we're we going to go back into our catalog. And obviously, we have to pick songs that we can actually still perform. Yeah. Um, a lot of those songs <laughs> that we wrote when we were 25 years old have a lot of screaming involved. <laughs> so, you know, we have to be selective uh, to pick pick songs from the Tesla catalog that are not so high pitched, you know, yeah, yeah. but we've managed to dig up some really cool gems. We have a song called freedom slaves that we're going to mm-hmm. pull out this year. Um, got no glory, some deeper cuts. Nice. And, uh, but on the Leonard Skinner tour, we're going to play mostly our hits and it'll probably be only eight or nine songs. Mm-hmm. Is it harder to play? Do you find as the years have gone by that it's harder to play the longer shows? Um, no, not really. It's not harder to play the longer shows, but it is harder to choose the songs. Yeah. Um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of different variables in our, in our, uh, with our age now and, Mm -hmm. and stamina and keeping it going, you know? And so again, you know, we wrote those songs back in a time period of the 1980s where everything was on 10, you know? And as you get older, you got to simmer it down just a little (laughs) bit. (laughs) Yeah. No, I was um, I was looking at um, you know I uh, some data, and I think the song that you played the most live. Do you know which one that is? That's no, a, tell me. Uh, Modern Day Cowboy. I think is about eight hundred times. Really? Where did you find this information? So I think it was Setlist.fm. Oh, okay. I'll have so, to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Modern day Cowboys is, is a, what we call a staple. You know, there's yeah. some songs that are just staples. Um, yeah. one of the songs that has been a staple is actually going to, uh, take a rest on this tour. And that's little Susie. Mm-hmm. We might be, I might be making a lot of, uh, people upset right now listening to this, <laughs> but little Susie's going to sit on the bench this year uh-huh. and we're going to pull out more of a, of a heavier Tesla song to replace oh, nice. her. Wow. That'll be nice. But uh, yeah. tell me, how do you think COVID would have has changed or might have changed being out on the road? Uh, well, we've been informed that we have to be very uh, careful mm-hmm. uh, during the day. Uh, sound checks. We're not going to have uh, a guest list with a bunch of people partying backstage anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to keep our we have to keep our social distancing still in effect. Yeah. Definitely on our tour bus. Uh, we're not going to be having people just hanging out on the bus and doing stuff like that anymore. Mm-hmm. So we have to play it safe, and we want to we want to do that because we want to keep keep the venues open, and we want to we want to yeah. reopen uh, the world for music shows again. So 
We're going to play by the rules. Yeah, I was reading uh, I was reading an Eric Clapton interview last night where I don't know if you saw it, but he said that he wouldn't play uh, a show where the promoter insisted that people need to be vaccinated. He said that's discriminatory and he wouldn't play those shows. Who said this? Eric Clapton. Oh, yeah. I heard he had a very bad experience with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's... Um, uh, yeah, and I know uh, a couple other people that have also had uh, some pretty bad experiences with it. Um, I think it's a personal choice, you know, honestly. Um, I don't think they should force people to, to take vaccines. Yeah, yeah. But tell me, how has Tesla's tour schedule changed over the years, uh, um, uh, Frank? Uh, do you still go out? I mean, pre-COVID, were you, were you going out on the road as much? Or is it that now that you have a loyal fan base, you don't need to go out as much? Um, well, I'll be honest with you. Um, right before COVID hit, we had just done the Monsters of Rock cruise. And mm -hmm. we were on a cruise ship. And uh, we were being interviewed on the cruise ship. Uh, have you uh, been to Asia? Um, have you been to China? Uh, have you been around anybody who's sick? We didn't know what was happening or what was to come. But slightly a few weeks before that, I had personally had a meeting with Tesla, the band, and asked mm -hmm. if we could take some time off because we have been hammering it hard since we regrouped in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, Tesla got started this train again. We broke up in 96 and then we got back together four years later in 2000. Yeah. And that train started rolling, man. And we, we, uh, we made into the now we made, uh, forevermore simplicity albums, twisted wires. Uh, we did the coming at you live DVD. Uh, we had to replace our guitarist and get Dave rude in the band. We did the real to real albums. We toured with Def Leppard. I mean, yeah. we just hammered it nonstop for almost 20 years without a break. So I was asking for a break and I got it, uh, <laughs> but not in the way that I wanted it, but uh, yeah. the break was good for us. We needed a break. Yeah, but you know, uh, uh, 2019, so I, I go to Europe every summer and I do the festival circuit. I work for some bands. I do some photography and video. And I've been a fan of your music from, you know, the early 90s. I've never seen Tesla in concert. And 2019, you guys were playing Shepherd's Bush, and then you were going to be at Hellfest. Um, so I was there outside the venue at Shepherd's Bush, couldn't get in, tried to get in touch with everybody I knew for a ticket. And I... Oh, man. Yeah, so I planned my travel from India because I wanted to come. I, I think I got to London on the 10th. I had a couple of days off and then I wanted to come see Tesla. And I was supposed to get, like I was sh shooting for this uh, French paper and I was supposed to get uh, media accreditation. And then that fell through on the day of the show. And then I tried to buy a ticket and I couldn't get a ticket. But um, I- oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, man, gosh. Yeah, so I was crushed, but I saw you at Hellfest. And I managed oh, to, yeah. I was shooting that at was Hellfest. That was a big one, man. I couldn't believe, it. and you know, Leonard Skinner was at Hellfest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big, that was one of the biggest festivals I'd ever seen. I couldn't believe how big that was. Yeah. I was telling Brian when I spoke to him a couple of months ago, it was incredible. How you guys sounded amazing on that day. Really? Thank you. That was early in the day we played too. Yeah. I, I think it was the, uh, it was the um, afternoon that you played. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that was a great memory. Uh, I, I, I remember I watched Leonard Skinner uh, that day. And, and it's amazing to me, these, the Hellfest and the European festivals, how many different styles of bands and different styles of music can play together on a festival. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a nice format, I guess. They have, they have different stages and, you know, it's on, uh, you know, three days and it's on, I think, about 15, 16 hours a day, so... Yeah, people just love the music, man. And if it's good, they love it. It doesn't matter what the style is, you know? Yeah, I think next year, their 15th edition is a seven-day festival. Yeah, well, the Shepherd's Bush show was pretty good, too. I'm sorry you didn't get in, but uh, yeah, now man. that you've got my number here, you'll uh, we'll have to be in touch. <laughs> yeah, We'll make absolutely. sure you take care of it next time. Absolutely. Thank you, Frank. But tell me, are you doing anything with the production itself? Are you adding more stuff um, this year? Well, 
you know, Tesla has always really been all about just being, keeping it real mm -hmm. and not relying on gimmicks and just being a gritty rock and roll band. Um, it was a, a leap forward for us to incorporate some video screens on the stage. And uh, when we go to Europe, we don't take the video screens. We just keep it stripped down. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to be new is a brand new single. We have a brand new song that we just produced. Speaking of production, we produced it ourselves, nice. which we've always kind of done that mm -hmm. anyway. But then the producer takes it to a different place. But this time we decided to just produce it ourselves and keep it really raw and real. And the new song is called Cold Blue Steel. And mm -hmm. uh, we're really excited to, uh, to for the fact that we've produced it ourselves and we've kept it really raw. Nice. Um, what about playing uh, newer markets and territories? Is that on the cards? Um, like you said, are you planning to come to Asia at some point? You know, obviously depending on the pandemic, but is that is that on the cards? Um, for me, definitely for mm -hmm. the rest of the guys and the management and the people that are in charge of the money, I can't tell you, you know, yeah. but man, my love would be to come to India. I've never been, mm -hmm. um, I'd love to, uh, you know, go to places I've never been before. And I'd like to go to Egypt and see the pyramids. I was just watching yeah. a, a documentary on the pyramids, uh, last night on TV. And I was like, man. I would love to go there. I know the Grateful Dead did a concert there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, no, uh, uh, yeah. It'll be fabulous if you guys can make it out here, man. Man, I would love to, you know. Um, let's just hope this pandemic opens it up for, for everyone and, and we can get back to reality. I mean, that's, that's, that's our biggest hope. Yeah, but tell me, do, uh, did, did Tesla get any, the government had a lot of relief uh, there was money that they put out, right? Uh, I think there was a, a billion dollars or a $10 billion thing that they put out. There was, you know, and they sent, I, I got a, a, an un, unemployment card and mm -hmm. uh, I used it at the grocery store maybe once or twice, but it didn't work half the time. So uh, I stayed busy on my own working, man. I, I like to work yeah. and um, I did some uh, some construction and some other things, working in the studio to, to stay afloat. Um, we did uh, get a, uh, uh, what's it called, a PPE loan or some mm -hmm. kind of government loan to help our road crew. Yeah, but you know what was crazy? I read that Pearl Jam and Guns N' Roses, the LA Lakers, all of them got uh, federal funding I think in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to support their crew. So I was quite surprised yeah, that by crazy. that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> what do you think about that? What do you think about that? What shocked me was I didn't, I didn't expect the names that I saw there to be the ones who right. received funding because I've spoken to lots of artists and, uh, Nobody seems to have got anything, but I was surprised that the Lakers got something and Shake Shack got, I think, a lot of money which they returned, um, you know, because they raised some equity funding before that. And, you know, Pearl Jam, Guns N' Roses, all of these guys, the Eagles, I think, Green Day. I was really surprised by that. Just the names I saw, I didn't expect to see those names there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of those are the same people that uh, complain about uh, <laughs> the government and, 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 uh, so, yeah, I don't know, man. It's a touchy subject, but yeah, yeah. But uh, tell me, you guys were doing, um, you know, you were you did the home series, right? Was it called Home to Home that you did during the lockdown? Yeah, we did some live uh, home. That was great. Yeah. Videos. Thank you. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's that's the, the idea for our next tour is called Let's Get Real. Let's get back to, yeah. to real life real life uh in the but nothing beats being in the same room with somebody yeah like right now you know this is cool we're on a zoom meeting and this is cool but i can't reach in there and shake your hand man and give you a hug you know it's a, it's a big yeah. difference yeah really which is something i was hoping to do at shepherd's bush uh you know it just didn't happen but anyway <laughs> right yeah uh that was crazy you also did the you did a six string um was it called the six string salute or the six salute that you did um, myself, I have an album called Six String Soldiers. 
okay. that okay. is a, is quote unquote a solo album. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's got some special guest guitars, um, Dickie Betts, Pat Travers, Rick Derringer, uh, mm -hmm. Dave Minichetti. They they play on the album uh, as special guests, and those guys I I I consider them to be six string warriors, you know, because yeah. they've survived so many decades of of playing guitar and, and music. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. The, that was the one for Crew Nation, right? I think the proceeds from that went to Crew Nation. Oh, oh, that's yeah. That was a sixteen salute. Yeah, that was a different. Uh, that was a um, a charity that we did for mm -hmm. uh, for for the road crews. Yeah, that was a different thing. That wasn't my six string soldiers. That was a different project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Frank Hannon band, you put out a new single, right? I did put out a single. Um, it's called Ride Strong. And it's a song that I recorded uh, with Kelly Nobles. He's a, uh, a legendary drummer up here on the West Coast, mm -hmm. uh, up from Seattle, uh, from a band called Rail. And yeah. uh, he plays double double bass drumming, which is nice. My one of my favorite styles of, of drumming. And uh, Kelly Nobles plays on the track. It's called Ride Strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me, do you? Um you know, when you do your uh, the Frank Hannon stuff, is there ever, do you ever think about experimenting with sound, like similar to what Jeff did with Bar 7 back in the day? Is, is that ever on the cards for you? Most definitely. Uh, um, when when a, an artist is in a band uh, like Tesla or mm -hmm. like when Joe Perry's with Aerosmith or, or when you're from an established band, when you do your own thing on the side, you do a lot of experimenting. And um, my solo albums, for lack of a better word, I don't like using the word solo. I'm not a solo artist. I'm just an artist. I yeah. play in Tesla, but I also do my own stuff. But as soon as you put solo on it, to me, it just like discredits it in a way. Um, but as an artist, I have experimented with uh, folk music, some acid rock, progressive my guitars for Mars album is really uh, more on the progressive side. Mm -hmm. My Gypsy Highway album is more of a singer songwriter acoustic stuff. Um, my From One Place to Another albums are uh, tribute albums to cover tunes that I've done. So, you know, I, I'm all over the place experimenting with stuff. Nice. Fabulous. I, w I want to ask about, you know, an album that, you know, I which never found its way to India for many years. And then I finally found a copy somewhere. And I think it was Singapore five man acoustical jam. Uh, how did, how did that whole album come about? This was, this was pre MTV unplugged, right? Or did MTV do something? And then you guys did this. Well, it was right all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, most every great band has always done an acoustic set. You know, Led Zeppelin used to do it, uh, the Stones. Um, so, you know, for us, we always put acoustics in our music and we were always kind of of that genre uh, influenced by the 70s bands. Mm -hmm. So we would take acoustic guitars to radio stations or events and, and uh, perform. And when we were on tour with Motley Crue, there just happened to be some time off that we didn't want to uh, waste. So we booked five shows. Uh, one was in Boston, one was in Philly, one was in New York, and we played some clubs. And uh, it was going over so well that at the last minute we decided to record it. And thank God we did because we got yeah. a great video and a great album out of it. Yeah. And number one, the song, Signs, the song Signs is a great song and uh, it, it hit people pretty good with the lyrics. Yeah, but that was a pretty bold move, right? Back in the day when, you know, there's all this amped up rock that's doing, that's on the charts and stuff like that for you guys to go out and do an acoustic thing. It was a bold move and our manager, uh, Peter Mintz, challenged us because uh, when he uh, offered us the, the show, and we were kind of not wanting to do it because it's not as fun to play yeah. acoustic as it is electric. Yeah. He, he, he uh, used some psychology on us and he said, <laughs> well, maybe you guys just aren't good enough, can't play acoustic. And we said, what? And so we accepted his challenge and we did it, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Bon Jovi, I have to give credit to. Bon Jovi um, at the Music Awards, they played an acoustic version of Wanted Dead or Wanted Alive. Dead or Alive, yeah. And I remember a lot of people really liked it. It was just Richie and John. And uh, 
that was kind of the first rock band, I think, of that time to do that. And then we came in, and then after that, Eric Clapton and everybody kind of made their unplugged mm-hmm. albums. But how how was it recorded, uh, uh, Frank? Was it just uh, was it like a single take thing? Oh yeah, one hundred percent live uh, in Philadelphia uh, mm-hmm. at a club. And uh, I was talking about this the other day when when we mixed it, we produced it ourselves. And when we mixed it, I made sure to leave the uh, the room microphones in the mix really loud so mm-hmm. you could really feel like you were there in the room uh and i think that's what sold the record i think people really enjoyed hearing the audience and the realness of the live album yeah i think i think what that also did at least for me as a fan was it actually brought out how good the the original song was right yeah and that's I, a good guess yeah if you can strip it down and it's exactly the lyrics, yeah. The lyrics and the melody still hold up and it's uh it shows that the quality of the song was there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that I think, you know, to do that, you just have to be able to play your instrument and sing live, right? Which in in the modern era of technology and, you know, all of this stuff that's going on, I don't know if somewhere that gets lost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially uh in modern music, um but even back then, um, a lot of bands were more relying on their image and on yeah. uh, the technology. And that's why we always put no machines as a little disclaimer, meaning that, you know, we played everything and it's raw. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, it's it's real. Yeah. How did the uh, the London Jam come about? Well, it was the 30th anniversary of the five man acoustic jam uh, time frame. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were in London for an extra week. So we had the time and it just so happened there was an opening at the studio. And again, it just came together naturally. Uh, the pieces fell together. And uh, we decided it would be really cool to to step foot in that studio. And I tell you, man, it just was an overwhelming experience uh, to be sitting in yeah. in that studio performing. Was it intimidating for you or... Well, kind of, it, you know, I mean, it wasn't really intimidating. It was just awe inspiring. Yeah. You know, um, John Lennon's piano sitting over there, you know, <laughs> the, the, the walls, if the walls could talk. I mean, I mean, how many times did I see the Pink Floyd movie where they're in there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Incredible. But uh, tell me, I, I, I wanted to ask you, there was a story I was reading about how you found Dave after Tommy quit. Was it true that you found him on MySpace? It is true, but it wasn't that easy. Um, I had uh, performed with a multitude of guitarists locally. Um, I had done a jam session in a, in a club where I had three or four guys sitting in with me. I had been keeping my ears open because, you know, uh, Tesla had been stalled so many times and had already lost so much uh, work and money based on the uh, problems that we were having. So. I started keeping my ears open. I, I flew down to LA and auditioned a few guys. And after six months to a year of not being able to find somebody, I was desperately searching MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't just a happy accident. It was a lot of work. And I searched for a guy here in San Francisco named Craig, uh, who plays in a band called The Ruffians. And uh, they're, they're a, a great San Francisco metal band. and he wasn't available. And so I was looking at his friends list and out pops Dave Roots mug. He was holding the guitar going, <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, that guy looks pretty cool. He's got some attitude. So, uh, I contacted him and went and played with him. And man, I just couldn't believe how, how well he wow. played, uh, the, what you give guitar solo. I mean, he nailed it. And that to me, that was the tiebreaker there with the, the way Tommy plays with such feeling. Yeah. It's not easy to find a guy like that. Yeah, it's like how uh, Journey, I think Neil Sean found uh, Arnel Pineda on, uh, I think it was yeah. on YouTube. That's an amazing story right there, too. Yeah, yeah. But tell me, I want to talk a little bit about your work with uh, the on the production side of things with Red Voodoo. Okay. Great band. I've been listening to them. Uh, so do you kind of mentor them as well? Is that the role you play with Red Voodoo? Um, 
Yeah, it was for the period of time that we were working together on the record. Um, they're very young guys, um, 17, 18 years old. And um, we live on a ranch up here mm -hmm. in the, and we have a lot of horses and animals to take care of. And they didn't have any money so to pay for studio time. So what we did is I traded them uh, a little bit of uh, work helping me uh, landscape and clean up the, the horse area and trade for studio time. Nice. And I think it was a great learning experience for them uh, because I don't think they've ever really worked before or had any blisters on their hands from having to use a rake. I had to go out there and teach them how to rakes, you know, I mean, put some muscle into it. And you know, that, that work ethic is very important, whether you're a musician or you're an Uber driver or yep. you're a janitor, whatever it is, you got to have the gusto and you got to have the, uh, the drive and the fight to not give up and, and be, uh, you know, cave in. So that was kind of the mentor role I took with them is teaching them how to work. Mm -hmm. Also, I helped them arrange all the songs. Uh, we t I took their ideas and turned them into to, to really good arrangements. And it was really easy to record because they have such tremendous natural talent. Everything was done in one or two takes live once we got the arrangements and the, the pre-production done. Um, the other artist that I work with on that capacity, his name is JT Lux. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a little older and he's a very hardworking guy and uh, very, a little bit more unique uh, as far as in his sound. So those two artists, JT Lux and Red Voodoo uh, are the two uh, young bands. And Austin Moe is another one. Austin mm -hmm. Moe is a guitarist in town. He's another young guy who's very talented. So I stayed real busy with those three, those three young artists during mm -hmm. the lockdown. Is it, is it a challenge, Frank, to help them kind of to mold their sound, to differentiate themselves in an era where there's so much music? And how does a new band or an upcoming band stand out musically? Well, it's, with any band, it's it's a combination of being inspired and, and what you're influenced by versus creating your own sound. Mm -hmm. So with a band like Red Voodoo, they're definitely inspired by 80s rock, Van Halen, and Sammy Hagar. And in today's world, there's such a void for that anyway, that, you know, they, they just go ahead, they went ahead and stayed true to that style, you know? Mm -hmm. And basically as an artist, you just got to do what you love. And, you know, um, JT, he loves more of a, of a indie kind of, uh, rock. And, uh, you know, I just try to nurture who they are and let them be themselves really. Yeah. But, but you Which is seen... what was done for us when we were kids and Ronnie Montrose and Dwayne Hitchings and people that were mentoring us. That's what they did. They encouraged us to be ourselves. Yeah, which is, I guess, all, that's so true, right? Because when you guys were breaking out, it was, you know, glam and what they called hair metal and all of that, right? Um, and, and you didn't follow that trend. You kind of bucked that trend, right? Well, yeah, because we were from Sacramento, which is, uh, you know, a cow town that's eight hours away from Hollywood. So, yeah. you know, we would drive to Hollywood, but we would want to get out of there as quickly as we got there because we were more down to earth, kind of just kind of hardworking farm boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But do you think the music business is harder now, Frank? You've seen it, you know, over the last 40 years. Do you think it's harder now? I think it's easier and harder. It's harder to uh, make a living at it because there's no physical products that you're selling mm -hmm. and everything is available on the iPhone instantly yeah. and it's over as fast as you put it out. So that makes it harder to make a living, but it is easier to be creative uh, with the technology. It's easier to become independent mm -hmm. and create music and put it out there. You don't have to bang on doors to a label to, to get yourself heard. You can get yourself heard yeah. on the iPhone. Yeah. Just like any, just like your next door neighbor. So yeah, it's a double edged sword. It's both hard and easier at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the conventional models uh, might die out. Right. I mean, you know, our record labels, for example, still relevant. Uh, I'm sorry you broke up. Say that again. No, I was just saying, you know, the conventional ways of doing things might change, right? For example, 
you have all these platforms now. How relevant is the concept of a record label, for example? Well, it's it's relevant if it's independent. You know, yeah. artists can create their own independent label. Yeah. Whereas before, it required a big corporation and a lot of money to create an album. You know, um, you in the old days, the conventional way was uh, the record company would invest a ton of money in promoting you and uh, uh, spending money on studio time, where now you don't need that. You yeah, know? yeah. Frank, before I let you go, two two things. Uh, you have a custom Gibson. Uh, you're doing something with Gibson guitars. You have a custom line now called the Love Dove. Yeah, yeah. That was a a, a, a tribute to Love Song that had come mm -hmm. out again another 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. We're uh, experiencing all kinds of 30 year anniversaries right now. Um, they made a limited run of 50 of them. It's a beautiful, beautifully made guitar. That's a recreation of a 1976 Cherry Dove acoustic that I used back in the early days that mm -hmm. during hard times, I had to sell it because I was broke and I needed to feed my family and I sold it to the Hard Rock Cafe. And now it's missing somewhere hanging up on a wall <laughs> in the Hard Rock Cafe. So Gibson uh, made 50 reissues of it. Beautiful. Yeah, I what saw I'm some more pictures. excited about is the Gibson SG that I'm playing now. That is mm -hmm. a really rare SG with a Floyd Rose tremolo, and uh, hopefully I'll be working with Gibson on recreating that one. Wow, fabulous! And you have uh, the the double IPA as well. It's is, it's called Hippie. Is it called? Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's called the Heavy beer? Metal Hippie. Heavy Metal yeah. Hippie. Yeah. Which is an autobi autobiographical uh, title. Uh, for myself that people uh, are aware of here locally because I love Judas Priest, but mm -hmm. I also love the Grateful Dead. I love mm -hmm. country music and Iron Maiden, you know, all that yeah. music is in my yeah. head. So it's a combination of being a hippie, but also loving heavy metal. And Fabulous. so that song inspired the brewery to, to create a, a great, very good tasting double IPA but it's very strong at the same time. You drink two of those and woo, <laughs> you're, you're down for the count. Yeah. Speaking I, of which, we sold 2,000 cans of the heavy metal hippie beer on the Monsters of Rock cruise before wow. the ship even left. And uh, everybody on that ship was pretty buzzing, I'll tell you what. I can imagine. Do you have a lot of it backstage? Uh, no, no. It's more on a local level at home. Um, we mm -hmm. try to keep control of the beer drinking on, on the Tesla tours. <laughs> Has it changed a lot backstage now from what it was? I, I'm guessing it's changed from what it was back then, right? Oh, yeah, it's definitely different, man. You know, we're older now, man. We can't bounce back as quick. So we try to appreciate what we got and keep it under control. Yeah, I did some work uh, uh, in 2019 with Billy Gibbons, and uh, it was very different backstage to what I had read about and what it was like in the 70s and the 80s. Well, first of all, all the lights usually are on now. <laughs> <laughs> we're back in those days we shut the lights off and who knows what happened in the dark yeah i swear but anyway frank thank you so much man thank you for your